loved us first, how you gave your life for us on the cross so that we can have life eternal. Father, be with us this morning as we continue through worship. Speak to us, allow our hearts and our minds to be open and ready to receive your word. Speak through Pastor Charles this morning. We love you and we praise you. As often as you would do this, Jesus says, what does he say? Do this in remembrance of me. I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul told the Colossians. We're going to get to the 1 Corinthian, uh, 1 Corinthian 11 passage in a moment. But Paul said to the Colossians, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. He told the Ephesian group of believers, it is by grace through faith we're saved, this not of ourselves, the gift of God. And so we who gather at the table is a group of believers whose sins have been forgiven. And those of you who might be yet to believe, or you know, maybe you're considering the claims of Jesus, but you haven't really made that decision yet, we would invite you just to sit by and take note of the occasion in which we gather. The Apostle Paul, though, said in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, I receive from the Lord, and so I pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he had took, taken the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you, so do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Well, whenever you drink this bread, excuse me, whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and they drink of the cup. What we find, the sacredness of this moment is found in the expression itself of Holy Communion, of taking time to say thank you, God, for sending your Son. And thank you, Jesus, that your body was broken, your blood was shed, that you allowed this to happen to save my soul from hell. I choose this day to remember how important this is. My body, Jesus said, broken for you. Given. Broken. Distributed. Sent out. To be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, the hope for everlasting life. Participation in the Lord's Supper produces the result, the reminder of Christ's agonizing sacrifice. Hebrews 9 verse 12 says, not by the blood of bulls, goats, and calves, but by his own blood he entered into once the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. We see here in this passage that the Lord's Supper is a look backward, isn't it? It's to be reminded that in days of old, before the coming of Christ into the world, there had to be the slaughter of bulls and goats and calves. There had to be the sacrifice for sin. And how would that be made possible? Well, it would be through the death of something precious. In the Old Testament times, the most beautiful expression of that would be an, an innocent lamb. Beautiful white little cap. 
slaughtered. Life was taken. That sins might be forgiven. So look backward. Paul said, I pass this on to you. What the Lord Jesus has given to me. And he broke the bread. The cup in like manner. Doing so, he institutes this new act of worship and remembrance. What we see in church history is that this baptism and the Lord's Supper is carried on throughout the church age. A lot of things were forgotten. It was happening in the early church. A lot of things have come to an end. Their time had come and gone, but not the church, obviously. You and I are living in the church age, and the church will continue until the return of Christ. Part of that will be sharing the message of Jesus with the lost world, extending the mission of Christ to the world, expanding the kingdom of God. That's going to go on until Jesus returns. A part of that expression of the church will be to baptize new believers. Symbol of their new faith in him. And to commemorate the Lord's sacrifice which led to that salvation by the passing of the elements. Distributing of the elements. The unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. And symbolically... We are participating in something incredibly sacred. A look backward. This is a great weekend to say, God, thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for sending Jesus to save me. Thank you for letting me live in a time where I'm not wondering if the Messiah is going to come. I can look backward and say, thank you, God, that he came. That's a gift in itself. But that he saved my soul. Did you guys know the Passover meal is another one of those, when you're studying the Bible, it's another one of those type, those types of Passover meal. It's a foreshadowing of a future Savior who brings deliverance, not from an earthly ruler, as what occurred with Moses, the Egyptians, God's chosen people, and the death angel passing over the Jewish people's homes who had placed the blood of bulls and goats on the door frames and the door posts of the home, by the way, which makes the symbol of the cross. It's not about that any longer. Jesus instituted something more personal, more sacred, more beautiful. Because Jesus' death on the cross, the scripture says, is once and for all. It's already been done. I want my sins forgiven, Lord. What must I do? It's already been done. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. O grave, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy stain? Thanks be to God through his son Jesus, who died to save us that we might live. For we are now, as Paul told the Romans, more than conquerors. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. John said that God loved us so much that he gave his one and only son. The apostle Paul said he gave the firstborn over all creation. And John says whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. It's a look backward at our own salvation. It's a look backward at how we received that salvation. It's a look backward at the cruelty <laughs> The brutality, the ugliness of the cross, the agony of our Savior suffering and dying for you and for me. I was talking to someone years ago now, I think. 
I lose track of time, especially with the whole COVID thing. Did y'all lose two years of time like I did? I, I, I forget sometimes how many years this has been, but I think it was right before the COVID thing, and we were talking, and he said to me, I'm not a follower of Jesus, but I love the idea that he would give his life for me. That's pretty powerful. And I said, you're so close. If you would just take that step of faith. He said, I'm not ready. I was watching Alice Cooper's testimony. Did you know Alice Cooper's a follower of Jesus? Is that possible? Yes, it is. It's an amazing story. He said that everything he's ever gained in this life, he would all give up to follow Jesus at this point in his life. Coming to Jesus was the greatest decision he'd ever made. And as he was sharing his testimony, he was looking backward that God had led him through so many twists and turns in his life, but never let him go. He couldn't see it before, but he could see it as a believer. That these weren't mere coincidences, these were, this was the hand of God leading him to this place. It's a look inward, isn't it? I mean, this is what the Apostle Paul says here. We ought to examine ourselves. We shouldn't just let this thing go in Holy Communion to say, oh, thanks. We should take it as an opportunity to go, thank you for what you did. I realize it was because of me that you died. I don't want to forget the ugliness of my sin that still resides in me in some way that led you to be nailed to a cross. I want to remember your broken body. I want to remember your blood that was shed was on my behalf. One who never did anything wrong, completely innocent, is nailed to a cross for the sins of all humanity. That's the measure of his love. But it's also a, a look forward. I love what Paul says here to the Corinthian believers in verse 26. He says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. It's kind of an interesting idea that we, uh, we call this 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And then it's a, it's a long letter from Paul. And then we have a book called 2 Corinthians. And it's another long letter to the church in Corinth. But actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says... You guys know what I'm talking about in my previous letter that I wrote to you and you realize, oh my heavens, there were three letters. First Corinthians is lost and first Corinthians is actually second Corinthians and second Corinthians is actually third Corinthians. And why in the world is Paul writing all of these long letters to the church in Corinth? Well, if you've read them, you realize these people had serious problems. In fact, theologians believe 1 Corinthians, the first letter that's been lost, was so scathing a statement by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth, a people basically living in the modern day, our modern day equivalent of Las Vegas, that there was something so wrong with them. God didn't even allow the letter to be, to be remembered, to be kept, to be preserved. And here we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And Paul, you, you just got to know as he's writing this, he's just scratching his head going, I can't even believe I have to say this to these people. 
my, my brothers and sisters in Corinth are now coming to the Lord's Supper table and they're bringing their own food as if that's what this is about and they're bringing their own wine as if, lots of it by the way, as if that's what this is about. They're drinking themselves at times into oblivion. They're stuffing themselves while others sit at the table with nothing to eat at all. Nothing with which to commemorate the Lord's sacrifice. It's a mockery they're making of this. And so the Apostle Paul, in a real pastoral moment, he had to say, look guys, I love you, but come on. What is going on? And so he provides for them what he calls directives. You know, scratch what you're doing and start doing this. You ever had the Lord say something to you similar to that? Please stop what you're doing and start doing this. He says it to me all the time. I don't know why he doesn't say it to you all. He does, doesn't he? I just want to admit it. Verse 27 to 29 reveals the whole, uh, the Lord's Supper is only for believers. We believe anybody who identifies as a follower of Jesus should participate in this, but we admonish everyone to have a heart that is prepared to receive communion. I know people who have come to the Lord's table and the, the, the the bread is passed to them and the juice is passed to them and they just pass it on because their heart is not prepared to receive the elements. You say, well, that's a little dramatic, isn't it, Pastor Charles? I don't know. The Apostle Paul says some people have died because they participated in the Lord's Supper without having a clean heart and, and, and were right with God. That sounds dramatic. Uh, it's probably also true. I'm joking. It is true because it comes from the Word of God. You and I must prepare ourselves, and I want us to do that now. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? As our men come forward now to prepare the table of the Lord, to dispense of the elements, I, I want us... spend a moment getting our hearts, our desires, our mind, our souls, our spirits right with God. Whoever eats the bread, drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. And so everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. For those who eat the bread and drink the cup without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment upon themselves. That's why so many are weak and sick. A number of you have even fallen asleep, a euphemism for death. I don't know what all that means. But I know the directive of our Lord to do this as often as we would. And Paul said that when we do, we must approach this with the right spirit. I love what King David said in Psalm 51. I'll read a portion of that for you. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from sin. He says in verse 10, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit 
to sustain me. And then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Thank you.